Um, just a little bit about my background. I'm actually an oncologist. Uh, I see women with breast and gynecologic cancers, and I've just started to see um, a clinic in soft tissue sarcoma. When I was in training in New York City at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, the gynecology program at Sloan Kettering was right across the hall from the gynecologic cancers program. And we ended up um, having a lot of collaborations. They would come to us about questions of chemotherapy, uh, but we never went to them about questions of sex and intimacy. Uh, but one of the times that they came over, it was to ask about if I'd ever seen vulvar toxicity from chemotherapy before. And being in gynecologic oncology, I do pelvic exams as part of my clinical practice. It is not something that many medical oncologists do. Um, but I'd never seen it before, and so I was brought into a room to examine a woman, and she was on a drug called liposomal doxorubicin, or doxol, or calyx is the other name for it. Usually it causes a very blistering, painful rash on the hands and feet. She had it on her vulva, and it was horrific. And it was so horrific that um, it took about several months, and she almost needed to stop her chemotherapy. And it's the only case report of that drug causing vulvar uh, erythrodysesthesia in the literature. And after I saw that, um, I realized that there's, there's a really a closer interaction between sex, intimacy, and cancer than many oncologists like to believe. Um, and I got trained as a sexual health specialist. And, and at this point, I've opened three sexual health programs. And the one that we have at Brown is called the Sexual Health First Responders Clinic. And you know, everyone always has a vision. It's like, oh, I need an orgasm stat. And that's where you go see me. That's not it. <laughs> but what it is is exactly what Jay mentioned. If you're in that clinic at Brown and you say, I can't have sex. It's too painful. I'm the stat page. All right, so my colleagues know to call me to get that patient into clinic. And that's how we operate. So in, in a sense, it is that urgent referral service, um, but I'm hoping to sort of shed light and to validate and normalize uh, what is an experience for a lot of folks probably in this room. So in terms of conflicts, this is mine. I always begin with a test, put everybody in the mood. It's after lunch. I don't want you falling asleep on such an important topic. So rearrange these letters for me, please. I'll give you a minute to look. <laughs> when the laughter dies down, I generally know it's done. All right. Did you get spine and subtext? <laughs> you did? OK. <laughs> because I did not the first few times I've taken this test. All right. OK. Why am I here talking about why does Jay want us to talk about this? It's because it's very common. And you don't have to lose a sexual organ to experience problems in sex and intimacy. So with breast cancer, depending on how I phrase the question, almost everybody has uh, or admits to sexual health difficulties. But if you look at colorectal cancer, it's almost as common. And with head and neck, which by the way, is probably the least studied of all of our cancers in this arena, five to six out of 10 women and men will say they have sexual health issues. This is also something that everyone going through it and comes to see me is so embarrassed about because they've never heard this in support groups, in person. They certainly want to talk about it with strangers. They can't bring it up to their doctor. So the first thing I often will tell people is that, do you realize how common that is? It is exceptionally common, no matter what age somebody is. And this is a study now pretty old. This was in 2010. And it consisted of over 3,000 people. And it was a survey of the post-cancer experience. And this is what they found in terms of sexual function and sexual satisfaction, that almost a third of folks ranked it, or a lot of folks were ranking it as one of the top three concerns. And for f over 50%, it was either a lot or just a little. But the third bullet point is the more important one. This is a very important concern that folks are not seeking medical help for. So less than half of you ever brought it up. And that's a problem because of this. If we don't do anything about it, it has detrimental effects beyond just your health. It can cause emotional stress, but 
in over 60%, it will take a toll in personal relationships. And this is something that we do know happens, that usually we try to think that, you know, very close partnerships at the time of a cancer diagnosis will become stronger. But that's not necessarily true. And even the strongest relationships can fray after a cancer diagnosis and its treatment. And one of the things that might be attributable to that is that things are so different and I don't know how to talk to you about it, okay? When I talk about sexual health, I do this on purpose and say it's about health and not an activity. So in this presentation, remember the following are all covered in this topic. It's about intimacy, it's about sensuality, it's about body image, it's about how you experience arousal, desire, how you experience climax, and it's how satisfied are you with it. So I'm not here to tell you you all should have a satisfying sex life, okay? And tell you what satisfying sex lives look like. Each of us have our own definition of what is satisfying to us, and that's the definition that I'm here to help you meet, rather than my telling you what your sex life should look like. So here's the first question that always comes up. Are men and women impacted similarly after a cancer diagnosis? Who thinks this is true? And who thinks this is false? And who doesn't really know? Okay, good, all right, honest. So the other way to phrase this question is, are women really from Venus and men from Mars? So the true answer is that women and men are impacted very differently from cancer. This is what we think about with men, okay? <laughs> it's really all about an on and off switch, right? If it's on, everything works fine, I'm good. But it's if, if it's off, several things happen. First, not only can men not function as they perceive men should be able to function, but then all of a sudden there's a withdrawal. There's a lack of intimacy. So even though that male or female partner of that man with cancer might say, I just need you here and I just wanna be close to you, a male with cancer may interpret that as saying, but it's inadequate. Why am I gonna go to first base if there's no way I can get to home? Okay, it's a really significant issue, but it's also incredibly complicated. This is female sexual health, <laughs> okay? So just like that computer when you turn it on, you don't think about, oh, then, you know, this switch turns on that motor and then this happens and it's, you're just, it operates. It operates as its normal way and then you get cancer. Or maybe you got symptoms before you were diagnosed with your cancer and then all of a sudden things weren't working. That computer was taking a little bit longer to operate, but then after all of that treatment, it's just not working. It's like the colors are gone and you just see a gray scale, all right? This is very confusing to everybody. For the partner, the things that used to motivate a woman to be sexually aroused are different. For the woman with cancer, she can't explain why things don't work like they did. All right, so what about female sexual health after cancer or what the hell happened to me? Right? That's really the question that a lot of women have. This is one way to explain what happened. This is Rosemary Basson's model of female sexual health. So what she proposes is that for women, sexual health is not physical, okay? It's not about penetration, it's not about oral sex. A woman is awoken sexually because of a want to be intimate with someone else. Right? They want something in their lives. That want of intimacy wakes her body up so that when touched a certain way at a certain part, it's arousing. And that arousal stimulates desire. And when desire is fulfilled, it's satisfying. And the process of satisfaction propagates the circle. All right? What is not in this picture? any singular activity that we associate with sex. There is no activity, not one. So 
for the men in the room or the women who love women with cancer. If your partner says, you know what would arouse me? If you did the dishes, that would be so arousing. Okay? That's not a lie. Okay? It's because that can be arousing. That can spark intimacy. That can be very satisfying to feel like you're being taken care of. Okay? So listen to your partners when they say, I don't need anything physical to feel close to you. The point about all of this, and I think the, uh, Dr. Nekaludov said this earlier, the point is not just to ask the questions so that we you know, can normalize and just say, yep, I understand. That might be all good, but people want to leave my office with a plan. What can I do about it? And the message to you here is it's important to address because we can make things better. Okay? How can we make things better for women? It starts with a history. If you have any issues related to painful activities involving your vagina, any kind of penetrative activities, I cannot diagnose you without a pelvic exam. If you're seeing a clinician and you're having pain and that clinician doesn't do a pelvic exam, you have not been adequately evaluated, okay? But if you don't have pain with penetration or you're not having vaginal symptoms related to painful intercourse, you may not need a pelvic exam for us to know what's wrong. Okay, so the, you know, a, pel a sexual health evaluation for women is not synonymous with pelvic examination. If you're complaining about just dryness, if you're, you know, you're, those tight jeans you wore before cancer are now so uncomfortable for you, that may be what's now termed umbrella-wise the genitourinary symptoms of menopause, all right? Short of estrogen, which by the way, even for women with breast cancer, is not unsafe. And I'll go through that a little bit in questions if you have anything about that. We can prescribe vaginal moisturizers to provide relief. And the way you want to use a vaginal moisturizer is five times a week you apply a moisturizer, and you apply it an hour before intercourse. Not once every so often when I think about it, okay? Think of your vulva and think of your vagina as an extension of your skin. As you moisturize on a daily basis, the same thing is true for your vagina. There is something out there using laser therapy to help treat post-menopausal symptoms of dryness. The only thing I'll say about that, it has very little data in cancer, uh, women treated for cancer. And also, there has been an FDA warning with laser therapy that it can cause burning um, uh, because you're using a laser on the vagina, okay? And then in terms of the hormonal therapy, I'm not, for women with breast cancer now, I'm talking about vaginal estrogen. We would not prescribe oral estrogen to women after breast cancer and that is, pretty cons that is a consensus. But vaginal estrogen is actually okay. But I'm not here to convince you that you will need vaginal es estrogen. If in your heart of hearts you don't want to go there, I would listen to you. Now, if you're treated for sarcoma, head and neck cancer, cervical cancer, ovary cancer, uterine cancer, I am very comfortable prescribing oral hormone therapy. Okay? For the vast majority, but the one thing I'll say is that it does require a very careful, informed decision on your part, and who gives you that information. It is my responsibility to give you the information. Now, when you go from va female vaginal health, so this is about health, and then we want to talk about things that we can do to help sexually. How can I increase pleasure for women who don't experience pleasure anymore. There are things that can be done. So, the, you know, at, the, at its most basic, find a lubricant that you and your partner appreciate and like, various kinds, water-based and silicone-based. There are, there are ones that are chemical-free, all right? The one thing I'll say, saliva is not a lubricant, okay? Um, now, the use of a lubricant, use it on your partner as well as on yourself, reapply as necessary. 
Now, you see lidocaine up here. This is where the exam is very important for anybody who has pain. There is a very specific syndrome where the pain is centered at the opening of the vagina. The experience that is described to me is I, you know, everything's fine, but when he tries to penetrate me, it's like knives or it's like needles going all across and he can't do it, I just can't. That can be fixed pretty quickly. If there is what's called vestibular tenderness, which is the opening of the, vag uh, the vagina, lidocaine, 4% aqueous lidocaine. It's so incredibly dilute water. You saturate a cotton swab. You place it right on the vestibule. In a study of 20, 20 women who were not having intercourse, 19 were able to resume penetration. And in my experience, it works very effectively. Now, dilators come in if you're having pain throughout penetrative activities, and oftentimes that's your vaginal vault, unconsciously spasming, all right? The experience that I hear about, I try to relax and it still hurts. He says to relax and I can't. I try breathing through it and it still hurts. The reason is your vagina has a mind of her own. She will not be told what to do, okay? But you can teach her to trust you. And that's the goal of a dilator. You control the depth of penetration with these you know, essential cylinders, and you control how quickly it enters and exits. So these are all things that can help make sexual health better. There are some things that are, uh, we're trying to work on to improve desire. There's a, there's a phenomenon that's well described where the entire thing works. Uh, pleasure, arousal, you, you experience desire, it's even satisfying, but after it's all over, you're, you're like, do you wanna go again? It's like, no, I'm fine. Would you ever wanna do it again? Not really, no. It's totally fine. Once is good. For your lifetime? Yeah, I'm done. So that's a hypoactive sexual desire disorder. The feedback loop isn't working. And for women who are premenopausal, there has been a drug approved, very controversial on whether or not it's really effective, but it's called phlebanserin. Um, no data at all on women treated for cancer, okay? So moving on, let's just talk a little bit about male sexual health. I mentioned the on and off switch. The assumption for men who've had cancer is that intimacy and intercourse are the same thing. All right, we only experience intimacy when, we're, when we are inside the person we love, which is just crap, right? Okay, so um, because of that, Ann Katz is a friend of mine in Canada, treats a lot of men treated for prostate cancer, and wrote a book about men and cancer and sex. So we took that on and off switch, and we made it more realistic in what's called a biopsychosocial model. Biological effects are important, psychosocial effects are important, and socially it's very important. And it's very complicated, here it is, all right? So talking it through, men have been influenced by the society they've grown up in. In a US market, it's the Marlboro man. It's all about masculinity. It's all about erectile function. It's all about the big cowboy hat, right? All right. That also determines our schema. Your schema is that societal message and what you grew up with from your friends, from your family, your church. It's how you model yourself and your sexual responses. And that actually determines the drive, which has an impact on your performance. But after cancer specifically, there are impacts that have been made to your body. And we're giving you medications, which may have its own effects. Okay, but all of that is also important because there's an intimacy bridge that influences how we react sexually. And for men and partners, with partners, that's where she or he comes in, all right? That communication can be critical. A woman or a man who says, it seems shorter to me than before you were treated for prostate cancer. That's not a great message for a man to hear, right? No one wants to hear that. But as important is when that partner says to you, 
you look as good to me now, after prostate cancer, after lymphoma, after a transplant, as you did then. I love you more than, you do, than I did then. That's a really important message for men to hear. The issue is, this society doesn't teach us how to say those things. All right? So the reason that this is important is because I don't think it's fair for any man in this room, cancer or not, to see themselves as a sexual being solely based on their penis. Okay? But it is important. I'm not trying to discount the impact of erectile dysfunction. Here's something. Um, this is some of the data I cited. For men who have erectile dysfunction related to cancer treatment, specifically prostate cancer treatment, that's where a lot of our data is, there is well known that these folks, these men, withdraw from their partner. Not only that, they withdraw from any intimacy. We're talking about sitting together on a couch, holding hands, walking through the park. These are the things that men withdraw from. And I think it might be because of erectile dysfunction, but it's because cancer is challenging their schema. Okay? And there's a lowered rate of sexual contact. The bottom line is that here. Relationships do suffer because of male sexual dysfunction. And if I had any, any advice for men in the room who are experiencing this, the normalization, understanding that this experience is real, it's not just psychological, it cannot be explained by a low testosterone. So if anybody ever had a testosterone level checked and they said, oh, your testosterone is normal, it must be in your head, that is not true, okay? So again, I think this speaks to the complicated nature of men, cancer, and sexual health. Just recognize that there are very different reasons that men have sexual dysfunction beyond erectile function problems. There's sexual bother. What does that mean? It means everything is fine, it works okay, but it's just not the way it was. All right. That bother can be pretty significant. So even in the absence of dysfunction, there can be bother. There can be ejaculatory issues where instead of going forward with the stream, it goes back into the bladder, which causes a lot of pain. And there can be reductions in penile length, either perceived or real. Okay? So all of these things happen. But even for men, there are treatments available. Here are some listed here. The mainstay has been medication, the PDE5 inhibitors. This is your you know, sildenafil, um, Viagra, Cialis, these drugs. Even though the, men, the women in this room will say, um, uh, you're lucky you have these meds available to you, I can tell you that is not true. These pills cost 20 to $50 per pill. And for a lot of men, that's just outside of their price range. So even for men, these are lifestyle medications, and most insurances won't cover it. All right? But again, many things that can happen. My, my research interest is now about couples. How can I help couples move forward? Someone asks about the caregivers in the relationship. Here's some advice, especially at the end of cancer therapy. Talk about the experience and what that was like for both of you. Because we know cancer is a social disease. And what we're going to try to do by talking about it is take you out of the role of caregiver, put you back in the role of lover. And that's a really hard thing I'm realizing for folks to do. If you're having issues with sexual dysfunction, these are the three questions you can talk and negotiate together. What do you wish for? Where do you wish we were? What do you want right now? What do you need from me today? Those are such different questions, and they're not easily answered. And then there's something called sensate focusing, which is a way to look and work at intimacy without either one of you having the expectation it's supposed to lead to intercourse. Finally, just taking your time about that. We do know that cancer is a significant stress for the partner. 
And I now know that this new normal that you're supposed to discover for yourselves is also something you need to discover as a duo. So with that, I'll just leave you with this, that the intimacy is incredibly important. And I think the literature backs that up. So again, this is as much of a journey as your cancer treatment has been for both of you. The launch into post-treatment um, aspects and survivorship is gonna be as important. So I will end there, thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Um, when you said that a woman should use um, the vaginal estrogen for um, six, five days, um, is that like a dehydrogen acid? When should she start doing yeah. that? Yeah, I think that's, so the question is when do you start using vaginal estrogen and how would you go about using that? So the five days in a row was over the vaginal um, moisturizers, so that's the non-estrogenic, uh, that's over the counter, it goes by the trade names Replens, there's one called Luvina, which is parabens free, um, but there are various formulations, if you don't wanna use a chemical, you can also use vitamin E, uh, it can also work as a good moisturizer, but that would be five days a week. Uh, more so. Now, where is the role of vaginal estrogen? There's been at least one randomized trial in women treated for breast cancer showing that uh, replens specifically can have an impact similar to vaginal estrogen. But for women who don't uh, respond well or who have an allergic reaction, say, to the vaginal moisturizers, that's when I talk about vaginal estrogen. I use the lowest dose possible, which oftentimes will come in a tablet that goes into the vagina. It's a 10 microgram tablet, which if you think of the historic days where we used to use a lot of estrogen is probably about a 10th to a one one hundredth of the dose of a systemic dose of estrogen. How would you, you would use that is you'd use it every day for 14 days. And then you do it every other day or two, two or three times a week. Now when to start it, you don't have to be in a relationship obviously to start that, if you are not partnered but you are dating, this is a time for you to also do a lot of self-discovery and also working on vaginal health. And these are all about vaginal health. I want you to think about it as very separate from sexual pleasure because these are things that will make a lot easier for women, including pelvic examinations. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. In all ways improve uh, my sexual function, which is good and bad. Yeah. And, uh, but would it help? Um, I, on a good day, I'm, I'm not uh, up to par on my testosterone, yeah. testosterone levels. Yeah. But, um, I, I'm wondering if I should look into making sure that yeah. uh, my levels are all the way up. Well, so the question is about testosterone supplementation, supplementation, testosterone levels, and sexual function, right? So, you know, when we find low testosterone levels, uh, usually the, the cue will be um, erectile dysfunction, uh, fatigue, uh, maybe weight gain. There, there are issues um, that come up. When we find it, we do. I do use uh, quite, a, quite a bit of testosterone supplementation. I can say the expectations that you're gonna be back to where you were in your 20s, that is sometimes the unrealistic part of it. Yeah. But if you're asking, uh, do I see sexual improvements with testosterone supplement, I do, yeah. yeah. But I guess it's the opposite. So if they saw your testosterone levels were normal and you had erectile dysfunction, there is still something to be said of that being a real phenomenon, because not everything can be related to testosterone, or doesn't have to be related to testosterone. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. 
Yeah. So the question is for women who have endometrial cancer and have to have a hysterectomy, what can they do to proactively to help I I improve or protect sexual function? So there was a randomized trial that was done across the country that, f that looked at women who had a hysterectomy for endometrial cancer. Half of that group of volunteers got estrogen hormonal therapy. Half of them got placebo. And there was no difference in cancer-related outcomes. So survival was the same. There was no increase in the risk of relapse with, with estrogen therapy. So for women with endometrial cancer, oral estrogen therapy is actually okay. And I'll point you back to the Women's Health Initiative, which is where we learned a hormone therapy causes an increase in breast cancer. That study is true. But what was lost in the noise of that study, there were two groups of women in that trial. One group of women had a hysterectomy <clears throat> before entering that trial. Those women were randomly assigned to either estrogen or placebo. But if you had a uterus, you had to take combined hormone therapy, estrogen progesterone, randomized against placebo. Estrogen plus progesterone increases the risk of breast cancer. That's the reason that arm was stopped. In fact, that's the reason the whole study got the press. Surprisingly, if you had a hysterectomy and you took estrogen alone, you had a lower risk of breast cancer. Yeah. I think we might have to go. So the last question, yes, yes, yes. Reloxifene, okay. Uh, yeah. Yep. In terms of what you should... Well, so raloxifene is a treatment uh, that we sometimes use for breast cancer prevention. The interesting thing about it, it does not cause an increased risk of uterine cancer. So it's likely those two phenomena are separate. But in terms of uh, whether, um, what you can do to, uh, to help your sexual health after uterine cancer, my advice would be go through the surgery, review the final pathology, see how you feel in follow-up, and then we'll decide. Thank you.